Hello and uh, welcome to our um, cultural competency presentation. Um, when and this is the um, Philadelphia COVID-19 Health Equity Coalition best practices on serving people with disabilities. I am uh, Liam Dockerney. I'm the Access and Functional Needs Coordinator in uh, Philadelphia. Um, with me is Anna Peng. Um, yeah, and do you want to introduce yourself, Anna? Hi, my name is Anna Pern. I'm the co-founder of the Chinatown Disability Advocacy Project. All right, and, and Neil uh, McDevitt. Hi, my name is Neil McDevitt. I'm the Executive Director of the Adoption and Communication Center, DHCC. And last we have Roger Indeci. Hi, my name is Roger Edeshi. I'm the Director of Occupational Therapy at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, but I'm a resident of Philadelphia. Thank you. Hi, right, did you know 16% of all Philadelphians, probably 246,000 people, and a physical, emotional, or cognitive disability in 2016, according to the latest data from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community, American Community Survey. And so there are two uh, sort of lenses that you can, and that society has traditionally seen disability through. Um, the first lens is the medical model. So here we have the sort of circle of the individual and a little person in the center of the circle uh, with problems coming at them. Um, impairments and chronic illness often pose real difficulties but are not the main problems. Um, so here the traditional view um, and disability is caused by physical mental or sensory impairments. Um, the individual is impaired and it's the problem. And the focus of the medical perception um, is on care and to uh, um, alleviate the effect. Um, and that leads to um, the focus being on the impairment. Um, and then the social model, which is where um, we are at right now, where our advocacy is sort of focused, is um, the, um, we have our um, society, is that the circle here, um, and the, with the our happy individual now is in the center of the circle, um, social barriers, um, the environment is inaccessible. Again, the, the focus is on the environment. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so, and this is uh, manifest in buildings, services, language, or communication. Um, attitudes are very um, prejudice, um, stereotyping, and discrimination. And organizations can be inflexible in their uh, procedures or practices. So this, this is our focus on inclusion here. And we see um, an inclusive sort of circle uh, being, you know, this society where there all our different colored dots are in this one circle, um, exclusion being the green dots are only in the circle and the colored dots on the outside. Um, segregation, meaning there's two discrete sort of separate circles. And integration, where both are in the larger circle, and there's sort of a cordoned off secondary circle inside the larger one. And so inclusion is really our, our, um, our focus and goal today. And so social inclusion, the meaningful social relationships between individuals with disabilities and other members of the community. 
um, share common interests, belong to a group or, or a team, have social roles which are valued, participate in community activities and opportunities together. Um, and this is a courtesy of the Special Olympics. Um, so topics we'll cover today, sensory processing and responses, Americans with Disabilities Act and Inclusion, Etiquette for Serving People with Disabilities, Communicating with Patients Who Don't Speak, How Language Has Evolved and What to Say, and Be Culturally Sensitive and Recognize and Classify Hi. I'm gonna present on sensory processing and responses. Your understanding of sensory processing will help frame your perspective on how people experience the world. For the next few slides, I will briefly give an overview of sensory processing and responses so you can have an awareness of how people perceive, process, and respond to information coming into their bodies. Next slide. Not all people with the same disability have the same needs. We need to remember that the ADA is a minimal standard. And a minimal standard does not necessarily meet individual needs or functionality. Just because a public accommodation is ADA compliant, it doesn't mean that it's inclusive or that they're meeting the needs of the person. So you'll need to be cognizant and inquire about individual needs and preferences. And that's why today's training is so important. Next slide. What is sensory processing? Sensory processing is how we receive, perceive, and interpret information from outside of us. Everyone perceives and responds differently to different sensations. As you can see in this slide with various images of people experiencing sensations such as the image of a man about to put a red chili in his mouth as he squints his eyes, the image of a crowded public space, or the image of a woman with outstretched arms sitting on the edge of a rock overlooking a very high cliff, or the image of a young child covering her ears, or the image of a young boy sitting underneath a tree quietly looking at a book. Everyone perceives and responds differently to the same sensation. Now, we all know the five senses of vision, hearing, touching, smelling, and tasting. Well, I'm here to tell you that someone taught you incorrectly. There are actually eight sensations. In addition to the five, there are three more all related to movement but have different functions. Vestibular is related to balance in our body to remain upright. Proprioception is related to knowing where our joints are in space. And kinesthesia is related to the direction of movement our body is going in. These sensory organs receive information through our eyes, ears, tongue, nose, skin, joints, and muscles. So we're receiving information from various parts in our body. And each of us has our own baseline or midpoint of what we can tolerate as far as that sensation. Sometimes these sensations go over that baseline and we become overly sensitive or the sensation doesn't reach our baseline and we strain to get more of that information. Think about your own responses under different conditions. Each of us has our preferred ways of processing sensory information. How do you respond to different sensory experiences? Imagine I was whispering. You might lean in to get closer to me. You might ask me to repeat what I just said. And you might ask to repeat what I said again. Or you might ask to repeat what I said again. Or you might just ignore me because the sound is not reaching your baseline to register the sound. And it's not that you can't hear or that you're ignoring me. You're just perceiving or registering the sound with less intensity. Now, when you show those same behaviors under conditions, when you're perceiving that information with less intensity, it's okay. But when a person with a disability often shows these same behaviors, Non-disabled people 
often say the behavior is strange or unusual. When the person with a sensory processing disability is doing what you do under the same conditions. When sensations are of lesser intensity, typically we add more sensation, like leaning in, asking the person to repeat themselves. You add these sensations or responses to increase the sensory intensity. For food without enough sensation, you might add salt or hot sauce to unflavored food to reach your baseline. Or when the sensation is too much, you might want to remove some of that sensation by covering your ears or remove yourself from loud noises. Standing still or moving very slowly when the gravity sensation is too much because you feel unbalanced or you feel you like you feel that you might fall. Shielding your eyes or putting on sunglasses if the lights are too intense or too bright. These are all typical responses that any of us might do. Next slide. So sensory processing is related to the intensity of sensory information. Children, youth, and adults with developmental disabilities, such as autism, intellectual disabilities, and other developmental disabilities, often have a sensory processing disability. For those with a sensory processing disability, they may be perceiving the information with greater or lesser intensity than how you perceive and interpret the same information. This perception and interpretation is real. Just because you don't experience the sensation in the same way, it doesn't mean that it's not real for that other person. You can't presume that you're feeling the same thing as other people. When a person with sensory processing disability displays the same responses as you when you're overwhelmed with information or when you can't gather enough information, you know, that person, you might look at that person acting strangely, or you might think that they're overreacting when those responses are often the same responses that you would do if you're feeling overwhelmed or if you're straining to get more information. A person may experience sensations with greater intensity than others as depicted by this image of a young boy covering his ears while looking out a window. This may be because the sensation is too intense and a person might cover his ears to reduce the sensation intensity. He is removing sensation when the sensation is too intense for his preference. You remove sensations when the sensation is too intense for you. A person experiences sensations with, a person experiencing sensations with less intensity than others as depicted by another image of an athletic man hanging upside down in an L shape with his feet at 90 degrees holding on to the ledge of a rock over a high cliff overlooking an ocean. And I know that's a very poor verbal description. He's hanging upside down on the edge of a cliff. Might be because his gravity sensation are not enough and the person is seeking more intensity. He's adding sensation when the sensation is not intense enough for his preference. You add sensations when the sensation isn't enough for you. You add hot sauce or salt to food. Every person has different preferences and responses just like you. Now that I've described the greater and lesser intensity phenomena as opposite phenomena, I'm gonna say it's not so clear cut as a person being one or the other. People have both and may experience different perceptions at different times. Sensory perception is often contextually based, which is why attending to the environmental cues and conditions is so important. If a person has greater intensity of sound, doesn't mean they have greater intensity to other, sen other sensations. Also, if a person has greater intensity to sound in one situation, they may not have greater intensity to sound in every situation. The takeaway from this slide is not to presume the person will always be one way or the other. The best approach for supporting the person where he or she is at is simply to convey, I'm here to help, let me know what you need. Next slide. So think about your responses to sensations that aren't enough or sensations that are too much. For example, riding the subway, the subway noise. You don't have control over those overwhelming sounds of the subway. Do you have the mental, emotional, and physical strategies to manage those overwhelming sounds? Not every person does. Some people choose not to use the subway. 
Others use headphones or play music. Or you might be forced into an environment without the tools needed to manage that situation. What do you do? You might try to remove yourself or get away. You might try to go to a less intense space. You might cover your ears, or you might become distressed and anxious, not knowing what to do. What would you do when you don't have control over the sensations coming at you? Not everyone has the strategies, tools, or abilities to manage these intrusive and uncontrollable situations. You, I, and many other people may not have the strategies or tools to manage everything all the time. So trying not to presume what the person is doing and why they're doing it is really important. Just because someone is not responding to you doesn't mean they aren't listening. They may be, talk, they may be taking more time to process the information. If they receive and perceive sound with less intensity, they just might not hear you. Or if the environment is overwhelming to them, they're focusing more on that overwhelming sensation rather than focusing on what you're saying. There are many possible reasons. Your patience, your kindness, not just seeing them with deficits, but recognizing that their responses aren't that different than yours if you perceive things with greater or lesser intensity. So what can you do? Do not assume other people perceive the same sensation in the same way as you do. Do not tell the person how they're supposed to feel or think or, or, or um, perceive. Build a relationship with the person. Prepare the person for the experience. Let them know what will happen without your personal commentary and your perceptions of what you're experiencing. Create, an invi create inviting opportunities for a person to choose to engage. Remember, there are eight sensations and each person has their own preferred way of engaging and processing based on their intensity of the sensation. And then provide opportunities for a person to process the sensation in their own responsive mode and time. If you have any additional questions or inquiries about what I've said today, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at r-i-d-e-i-s-h-i at g-w-u dot e-d-u. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Adeshi. So the key takeaway um, from Professor Adeshi's presentation is think of access and functional needs as human needs and not special needs. Next slide. So my name is Anna Pering. Um, I'm an Asian American woman in a uh, bedroom with blue walls and a lamp in the background. I am uh, a woman with long black hair and my pronouns are she, her. So on this slide, we're going to talk about Americans with Disabilities Act and health equity. Next slide, please. So uh, disability rights are human rights. Um, historically, people with disabilities have been denied fundamental human and civil rights. The 20th century signaled a turning point with the passage of hard-won landmark federal le legislation that altered the lives of people with disabilities and their families. And on this slide is a photo of attendees at the Art Reach uh, audio described tour of the Philadelphia Flower Show. There are two people standing close together, their arms intertwined. Um, a woman reaches forward to press uh, the, her hands to her nose. Um, there is a plant in front of her. So she has just touched the, the fronds of this plant and now she's smelling the scent. Next slide. So the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, became law in 1990. The ADA is a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private places that are open to the general public. The purpose of the law is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. 
And the ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. Next slide. Did you know um, that with that said, um, this definition of disability includes people who have a record of such an impairment, even if they do not currently have a disability. It also includes individuals who do not have a disability, but are regarded as having a disability. Not all disabilities are apparent. Next slide. The ADA applies to health providers, and that's why we're giving this presentation today. Title III of the ADA prohibits private places of public accommodation from discriminating against individuals with disabilities. Examples of public accommodations include privately owned, leased or operated facilities like hotels and restaurants, retail merchants, doctor's offices, private schools and early childhood education providers, health clubs, sports stadiums, and movie theaters. Healthcare organizations that provide services to the public are covered by the ADA. Next slide. And we thought it was important to address what health equity is. The CDC defines health equity as health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of a social position or other socially determined circumstances. Health inequities are often reflected in differences in length of life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability and death, severity of disease and access to treatment. And the content source for that is again, the CDC National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. Next slide. So I thought I could ask Neil McDevitt to address this slide. So Neil, if you can present on this. <laughs> And Neil, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> I forgot to unmute myself. So one of the big uh, challenges in this space is really that there are really two different laws related to um, civil rights for people with disabilities in the public um, sphere, if you will. So this slide uh, is titled, Many Private Owned Lead Businesses are now covered by the more expansive Rehab Act of 1973 rules. Um, the Rehab Act is a law that was passed back in 1973. It has more um, stricter rules, um, less exceptions related with access. So whereas the ADA provides some flexibility, leeway for small businesses. The Rehab Act basically says any organization that receives federal funds is not exempt. So with so many private owned in these businesses accepting federal funds, for example, payroll protection program, um, shuttered venue operators grants, economic injury, disaster loan grants. They are now recipients of federal funds and are required to provide accommodations and not allowed to discriminate against people with disabilities. Um, the challenge here is nobody's tested that. So we don't know exactly how it's going to weed out, but generally speaking, any organization receiving federal funds can use the traditional exceptions, exemptions within the American Disabilities Act. Thank you so much, Neil, I appreciate it. <laughs> Next slide. So I'm, I'm gonna go into etiquette for serving people with disabilities. Uh, first, I do wanna say that, and I'm glad you uh, gave your pronouns. I forgot to model that in the beginning, but I think it's It'd be a good example of starting the conversation on pronouns that we'll get into later. But um, yeah, my name is Liam Duffany. I, um, 
I use he, him pronouns. And visually, I'm a, a white male appearance. Um, have a brown shaggy hair and a uh, black and white uh, checkered shirt. Maybe I should say very shaggy hair. <laughs> Maybe too shaggy. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, I'm sorry, sorry about that again. The, uh, the approach, um, if you routinely ask patients without a disability persistence, then treat the patients with the disability in the same way. Um, just like any other patient, I, um, act how you would normally. There is no need to alter your, your pitch of your voice or change your demeanor. Um, if you are approaching a blind patient or patient with low vision, please introduce yourself as a healthcare provider. Do not assume the people and person they are with is their caretaker. Um, many of us have, have families and other loved ones that we're with, and I think it's a, it's a very sadly frequent thing that the people are just assumed their caregivers. Um, address them directly, not the members of their party. Um, that's very important there too. Um, allow the individual to tell you what they need. If they decline assistance, move on. That was adapted from the Arc of Philadelphia Incorporated past training. Um, be helpful without being offensive. If the patient uses any type of assistive device, whether it be a wheelchair walker, rogers, or communication device, please do not touch, lean, or grab on without their permission. They can be considered extensions of their body and should be treated as such. Again, very, very important and a very common uh, mistake. Um, if assistance is needed, follow their instructions on how to properly support them. If you're not sure what you're doing, um, if you're not sure what you're doing is right, you can ask, is this okay or how, how am I doing? Um, when making conversation, don't ask, how did you become disabled or what happened? Um, people who have stunners usually prefer to finish their own sentences, refrain from finishing their sentences or suggesting a word for them. Persons who are blind or have low vision, when interacting with a blind or a low vision person, um, still should look at and face the individual, individual even if he or she is with another person or people, do not attempt to leave the person, leave the individual without asking. If they are okay with it, offer your arm resistance. Do not grab their arm and guard them. If you are guarding them, please describe the environment. There are four steps below. If you are serving as a sighted guide and other people approach you, um, let them know you're already assisting the patient. Don't get distracted. Patients who have mobility disabilities, do not lean on a wheelchair or any other assistive device. Do not assume the individual wants to be pushed or guided. If the individual appears to have difficulty and needs help, as ask them first. I'm gonna underline that. As ask them first. Um, do you need help opening the door, or do you need help pushing your wheelchair? If you decline their help, respect their answer. And here in the red box, keep calm and don't touch my chair. Practice active listening. Be patient and give full attention to the person who may have difficulty communicating. Some people need extra time to respond. 
show that you are listening, orient your body toward the person. If you can't understand someone, don't pretend like you do. Ask questions that will help you understand. Many people with hearing loss still have some ability to hear. They may ask you to speak more loudly. There is no need, however, to, uh, to speak to them as if they were a child. Presume competence. We often assume the person we are speaking with does not have the capacity to understand what we are saying. But this is often not the case. Treating or speaking with the individual, whether the person immigrated to the US from another country or is a person with a disability as a child is inappropriate. inappropriate. Or refrain from using baby talk. Avoid giving the patient overly familiar pet names like Mamie, Sweeney, or Bunny. Uh, this is very heavy for a little longer here. Uh, so now I'm going oh, to go through. Uh, Liam, uh, sorry, Neil McDevitt will be presenting this part. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, myself. So I'm going to pick up the example of Anna and Liam uh, started. My name is Nia McDavid. I'm a portly uh, white man with brownish blonde hair. I'm sitting in my office uh, with Doctor Who posters and knickknacks behind me. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, so I'm really excited to be joining you today to talk about specifically about uh, speech and communication and really focusing on how we can make sure that we are embracing communication of its different forms. So next slide, please. This slide has uh, is titled Types of Communication and we have two pictures of um, AAC. I will explain what that means in the next slide, but Ron is a more low-tech version using uh, flashcards and on a Velcro strip. And it says, I want, and there's another um, card that says cereal, milk, microwave, and I think it says hot at the very end. The second image is a picture of a tablet computer and it has um, all different types of food shown. And the top says, I want to eat chips. Next slide, please. The, the title for this uh, slide basically says, when a patient uses augmented and alternative communication. Non-speaking does not mean non-thinking. Non-speaking people understand everything that is said around them. Some people will use um, augmented and alternative communication, AAC. So a basic uh, version of that is a picture um, exchange communication Again, if you remember the previous slide, it had uh, flashcards you could see and it shows a picture of what you're discussing or writing. Then we have high tech versions, the electronic devices that require the guest to type the message. And then it is spoken, may have preloaded spoken messages, or they may have a software that offers thousands of words, phrases, word prediction, spoken output, visual displays, internet access, etc. Some of these things take time. Be patient, give them time to use the AAC. Next slide, please. This is more personal to me because I'm a deaf uh, person and I'm probably the person who wrote this, uh, I can speak with a little bit more authority on this. But the title is, 
uh, tips for serving Deaf Americans one-on-one. -on -one. First of all, we always ask that person for their individual communication preferences. Uh, as Roger mentioned earlier, you've met one person and their needs, that could be completely different than the next person and their needs at that particular time. So having an ongoing conversation about communication preferences is critical. Recognize that what works one day may not work the next day. When possible, use support such as qualified ASL or other language interpreters. Discuss communication strategies in advance, especially if an interpreter is needed. Um, like sometimes, for example, I will have a conversation with my doctor about you know, if we're just having a regular physical, I don't need an interpreter, we can use these supports. But if we are in this situation and serious, I have to have an interpreter and I need your advocacy to make that work for me. If an interpreter is needed, you should, especially here in Pennsylvania, you should only use qualified state registered interpreters. Um, the state of Pennsylvania requires that interpreters are certified by the National Certifying Body and registered with the state for them to be able to interpret here in Pennsylvania. Don't assume that the deaf person can speak for you. In addition, additionally, keep in mind that only one third of spoken English is understandable on the lips. So one example of that is take three words, maybe, baby, pay me. They look all exactly the same on your lips. And you won't really know what the conversation is about unless you explain what the context of the conversation is about. And the sources from the Healing Communication Center, our training programs. Next slide, please. One of the most important things that we want you to leave with is understand that just because somebody is nodding their head doesn't mean they understand what you are discussing. And one of the most common practices to get out of a difficult situation is to simply nod your hand and hopefully the other person leaves. And, um, but if we're discussing something very important, you wanna make sure they understand. So avoid using yes, no questions. You might want to ask open-ended questions. Like for example, instead of asking, do you understand what we talked about today? You may wanna ask, um, can you give me, can you tell me what we discussed about your diagnosis today? If the person says yes, you know they didn't understand what you've just been saying. Speak clearly at a normal pace. You don't need to exaggerate or overemphasize speech. And in fact, that actually makes communication more difficult. Maintain eye contact. Face the person when you're speaking. The deaf person's ability to see your face will help the communication effectiveness. And the last point is probably one of the most critical ones. Use any combination of the following items to really enhance your communication effectiveness. Facial expression, gestures, body language, paper and pencil. Again, all of those will help in setting what the context of the conversation is about and make the conversation last work for the deaf and hard of hearing person. You have to remember the person doing all of the work in this conversation is not the hearing person, it's the deaf person. Next slide. <coughs> um, when, when communication becomes difficult, we have a habit of repeating ourselves. 
So we recommend that people rephrase, not repeat, or write down information when you are not understood. Some words are more difficult to speech read or understand in English than others. And again, if not, don't want to say, you know, the weather's hot today five times and nobody's going to understand that. You might want to say, you know what, outside it's really hot. And that may be the uh, trigger that helps the person on all they establish the context and understand what we're discussing. Consider visual environment. Now, uh, but right here in my office, yeah, nothing is moving behind me. There's no bright lights behind me. The sun is not a factor here. But if you were outside, that may be a different story. Uh, an environment with a lot of movement, especially when it's behind me at speaker, can become very, very distracting. Try to sit where the light is on your face and not behind you. Next slide. And um, words matter, language has evolved. People, people first language and identity first language. People first language refers to the individual first and the disability second. Example, Joe has autism. For handouts of videos on people first language, please visit this URL, bit.ly slash people first 2019. Although some individuals with disabilities do favor people first language, a growing number of disabled people, especially from the deaf community and the autistic community, prefer identity first language. An example of this, Joe is autistic. Um, Syracuse University's Disability Cultural Center says the basic reason behind members of these groups dislike in the application of people first language to themselves is that they consider their disabilities to be inseparable parts of who they are. And again, when in doubt, ask politely. All their terms like handicap and R-E-T-A-R-D-E-D, -E we're part of disability organization and government agency names. Over time, people have used descriptors of IQ-based in intelligence, um, Indian, imbecile, and moron as insults to demean people, which then dehumanizes people with intellectual and other disabilities. In 2010, President Barack Obama signed Rosa's Law which replaces several instances of mental R word in law with intellectual disability. Um, for more resources, contact the Ark of Philadelphia or visit sparkphilly.org. All right, so here's some examples of words to use. Words matter, say people with disabilities, that's the uh, person first method from before, or disabled people, which is also okay. Um, identity first, instead of calling people handicapped or special needs, handicapped has some really negative uh, connotation on it. He or she has an intellectual disability. Instead of he is mentally awkward, slow or special, a um, person who uses a wheelchair instead of he's confined to a wheelchair or she is wheelchair bound. Um, um, she is blind or has low vision. Uh, they are deaf or hard of hearing. Instead of she is visually impaired, they are hearing impaired. Um, hard, hard of hearing is an inappropriate term there. Um, he has a mental health diagnosis 
for she has a mental health disability and a mentally disabled person or crazy are things we should avoid saying. Um, please do not use functionally labels. Uh, functionality to describe people. Um, cultural safety, serving the LGBTQA people. LGBTQA stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. Pronouns are the words of, to refer to someone often used in place of a person's name, of a person's name. For example, you might say that is her desk. You can always know what someone's pronouns are by looking at them or by watching the first part of this presentation because I, I forgot to model that, so again, I applied that. Asking and correctly using someone's pronouns is one of the most basic ways to show your respect for their gender identity. When someone is referred to with the wrong pronoun, you can make them feel disrespected, invalidated, dismissed, alienated, or dysphoric, um, often all of the above. And that's from the mayor's office of LGBT affairs here in Philly. And uh, what are pronouns? Pronouns can look like, but are not limited to he, him, his, which are masculine pronouns, she, her, hers, feminine, they, them, theirs, neutral, z, 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 neutral, z, 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 z um, his, hers, um, and I, I, I think we, this would be a good point to also say that we, if you get this wrong, it's totally acceptable to go back and correct yourself, uh, meet people at a place of understanding. I think that's really important for really our, our whole presentation. Um, remember, you can always know someone's pronouns by their appearance. You can respectfully ask which pronouns to use. It is important to use the correct pronouns when referring to someone because it honors their gender identity and is a sign of mutual respect. Respecting people's pronouns. If someone's pronouns are unfamiliar to you, they, they, um, there are resources. The website practicewithpronouns.com no spaces can help you learn about using pronouns. What if I make a mistake like I just did? If you accidentally refer to someone with the wrong pronoun, simply apologize, correct yourself, and move on. And that was in this before this presentation. <laughs> that was uh, uh, well, totally organic, I promise. Um, for example, the other day he, sorry, I mean, she is moving to Philly. Um, and remember, never, never referred to a person as the in or he, she. These are offensive slurs used against trans and gender non-conforming individuals. Thanks, Liam. Um, I'm going to go over implicit bias. Next slide. So implicit bias. Um, bias is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person or group compared with another, usually in a way considered to be unfair. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. Implicit biases are pervasive the implicit associations we hold do not necessarily align with our declared beliefs or even reflect stances we would explicitly endorse. We generally tend to hold implicit biases that favor our own in-group, though research has shown that we can still hold implicit biases against our in-group. 
implicit biases are malleable. And the source for that is the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. Next slide. Types of bias. Religious bias is a form of discrimination that results in the different and unequal treatment of religious groups. Anti-LGBTQIA bias is a form of discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and or gender expression. Racial bias is a form of discrimination that results in the different and unequal treatment of racial groups. Gender bias is a form of discrimination that results in the unfair treatment or stereotyping of men and women because of their sex or gender. And again, the source for this is the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity. Of course, we recognize that there are also other genders. Um, class bias is prejudice or discrimination on the basis of social class, the grouping of individuals in a hierarchy based on wealth, income, education, occupation, and social network. Next slide. So examples of bias against people with disabilities uh, that we might hear you know, in the healthcare context. Well, here's a quote, we don't normally serve uh, people with special needs. Or another comment could be, they should just go somewhere else. Isn't there a health provider trained to deal with those types of people? Or, um, well, he doesn't look disabled to me. How you can be an ally um, is to say, we serve everyone. We are committed to learning more and doing better. And not all disabilities are apparent. Next slide. Be flexible. We all have a lens through which we consider some human behavior expected and unexpected. So for example, with greetings, Americans may greet someone with a handshake Maybe not during now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, but <laughs> consider that in some cultures, it may not be acceptable for a non-related male to touch a female patient or guest, or a person may experience light touch as being intolerable. And regarding personal space, Americans tend to stand two and a half feet away from their communication partner. To assist a patient, someone might step closer but this could be a violation of that person's personal space. Observe the distance between you and the guest. And if you are in interacting with a deaf person, they might stand further just to view the sign language by an interpreter. Next slide. So getting someone's attention, you may be used to using your voice to get someone's attention by saying, hey, or excuse me, you may want to wave to secure someone's attention on eye contact. For some people, eye contact may be considered too intrusive, rude, or even uncomfortable. Don't force it. For deaf people, it can be considered rude for someone to break eye contact. It can be the same as a hearing person covering their ears. And on touch, people may not like to be touched. If someone is deaf, however, touch can be a way of communicating, excuse me, when passing by. And again, you know, a wonderful resource that we have here in Pennsylvania is DHCC. So if you need more information, definitely contact Neil McDevitt. And at the end of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, we will have our contact information. Next slide. So again, um, something that we would like everyone to take away um, is just that excellent patient service is based on two habits, focusing on the person rather than the disability or label but also not making assumptions on what the person needs, right? So the accommodations really should be individualized. And as Neil mentioned, it should be a collaborative process. It should feel like you're making a plan together um, rather than having someone make assumptions before that person has arrived. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Liam. And thank you, Anna. Uh so um, our presentation today was developed by um, the several, several people and organizations. So a uh, huge thank you to everyone involved here. Um, disability is such a big and, and wide um, um, sort of umbrella. And so, um, presentations like this are only possible with a lot of hands on deck. So 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so here are some local resources in Philadelphia. Um, and these are resources for Philadelphia activities, but also if there's something that uh, you want um, kind of uh, further advice on or something that you want to um, have it elsewhere in the state, please uh, consider um, contacting us here, all of, the, all of these names. And yeah, we just want to all say thank you. And um, uh, thank you for, for um, um, sort of incorporating this, this um, thinking into um, your activities. Thank Thanks, you all. Could we go back to the other slides? Um, I'll just read them for the folks who may not be able to see the, the screen. <laughs> I appreciate that. So the presentation was uh, developed by the Chinatown Disability Advocacy Project. Um, Professor Roger Adeshi, um, at Program Director, Occupational Therapy Programs at the George Washington University. Um, his email address is r. I D E I S H I at gwu.edu. We also want to thank Neil McDevitt, the executive director of DHCC. Uh, DHCC, you can reach um, Neil at n m c d e b i t t at dhcc.org. The website is www.dhcc.org, and by phone. 484-540-0476. And thanks to Special Olympics Philadelphia, Executive Director Chase Trimmer for, uh, for sharing resources. Special Olympics website is www.sopaphilly.org. Next slide. All right, and we're lucky here in um, southeastern Pennsylvania. Neil, would you like to just explain a little bit about the Access and Functional Needs Subcommittee? Yes, uh, the Access and Functional Needs Subcommittee is part of a larger organization called the Southeast Pennsylvania Regional Task Force. That group of um, emergency management officials from Philadelphia and the Pennsylvania counties that surround Philadelphia manage uh, federal homeland security funding. And the subcommittee focuses on people who uh, have disabilities and uh, maybe speak different languages or have um, immigrant experiences. In other words, things that don't fit the normal playbook. Uh, our goal is really to make sure that emergency management and public health serve all people within the community and we lend our expertise for those experts. Myself, um, Danielle Connor, and Ashley Isola are the co chairs for that committee. Danielle can be reached at K O E R N E R D at cofdelaware.pa.us. And Ashley can be reached at a isola at foxcounty.org. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, that subcommittee is extremely active, is a wonderful sounding board and a place to share resources, a wonderful community. Um, and thank you so much, Neil, for your tremendous leadership. Um, we also have, uh, of course, our own Liam Doherty, who has been on leading this training. Um, Liam is Philadelphia Department of Public Health's Access and Functional Needs Coordinator. Um, if you would like information related to this training or maybe need help getting in touch with uh, those of us, Liam's email address is liam, L-I-A-M, dot Doherty, D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y at phila.gov. Um, special thanks to Tara Khan, Family Nurse Practitioner at Family Practice and Counseling Network, Disability Rights Pennsylvania, Public Health Management Corporation, the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University, Mayor's Office of LGBT Affairs, and the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities um, for just providing a lot of support and resources. Um, so with that said, I just wanted to give Roger a chance to make any remarks <laughs> before we close. 
No. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you for participating in today's training. Again, I'm grateful to Neil, Liam, and Roger for uh, putting this together, but also creating a resource to help our health partners um, and community partners statewide uh, make vaccine equity uh, reality for people with disabilities, caregivers, and other partners. Thank you.